Um, so for the last talk of uh, our session today, we're very happy to have Nadi Cyber here from the Institute for Advanced Study. And he's gonna tell us about exotic theories and UV IR mixing. So I have, thank you, Nadi. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for the invitation and I to apologize for not being there in person. I was in Ascona in person a few years ago and it was absolutely fantastic. And when I got the invitation to come again, I immediately accepted it. And I think Nicholas can testify to that. And unfortunately, there have been some events that stopped, that made it more challenging, more to you than to me. And I hope that the, I, will, I will get a rain check from you about uh, for future invitations to Ascona because it's so beautiful there. So let me start the talk with an introduction. There is a lore that all of us were educated by, or maybe I should say brainwashed by, that whatever happens at, long, at short distances, at long distances it's captured by local quantum field theory. And specifically, if we start from some lattice system with short range interactions, with spins, and they interact in some way, if they're fermions or bosons, or whatever you, at long distances, the lattice is not important, all the information in the UV is washed out, and we have some continuum theory at long distances. There are some signs from string theory. There is string constructions, uh, specifically a little string theory, theories in non commutative spaces, which tell us that things might be a little bit more subtle than that. And this statement is perhaps too strong. But what really convinces me that the statement is too strong is some recently discovered models by condensed matter people. And I lump together different categories according to they would put the, the, them in different categories. I lumped them both together. There's a model that can be referred to as the XY plaquette model by Paramakanti et al., uh, which I will soon discuss. And also various fractal models. This is a huge field. These are the papers that started it, three papers that are the first ones, but then there are lots of other examples. And what we learn from these examples is that they're really innocent looking. These are perfectly innocent looking lattice models with local degrees of freedom, with local interactions. You look at them, you don't see that there's anything peculiar that, about them until you start analyzing them, them in detail. And you see that the long distance behavior is not captured by a local quantum field theory. That's what's so surprising. And since something so fundamental about quantum field theory is not understood here, I think this is something that should be pursued. And I'll say, be more specific about what's peculiar about these models. First of all, their kinematics is very peculiar. They have symmetries that we have not seen before. These are symmetries that are called subsystem symmetries. And the symmetries, global symmetries, that do not act on all of space, but act on codimension one or codimension two of space. So we have seen similar things for in higher form symmetries, and they're very popular and very effective. These symmetries are different in the sense that as we, they are not topological. We can move the, subs, the subspace on which they act a little bit and the symmetry has totally different uh, effect as we move it. So that's from the kinematics and from the dynamics, they exhibit UVIR mixing. This is what I alluded to here, that the long distance behavior, I mean the IR behavior is very sensitive to short distance peculiarities. So, how should we think about them? And this is very subtle. And during the years of the pandemic with fantastic collaborators, uh, I've been exploring these systems. And the main tool that we eventually learned to appreciate to help us organize everything is to come up with a new lattice model, which differs from the original lattice model. It's still local, it still has finite, some, some degrees of freedom, sides, links, plaquettes, et cetera and some local interactions, but they're very close to the continuum model. So I'm not going to discuss it here, except to mention that these lattice models have all have many, share many properties with what would be the continuum theory. All the internal symmetries are manifest on the lattice, including all the merging symmetries. There are two anomalies that can be seen on the lattice and all their consequences and various dualities. And these lattice models provide us with a rigorous formulation of the continuum theory. Now, this is very important because the continuum theory that we're going to discuss, and we'll see it soon, 
do not work the way we've learned about continued quantum field theory in, in class when we took quantum field theory 101. For one thing, various discontinuities in field space are very, very important. So when we first wrote the continuum descriptions of these models, one was very nervous. We were also very nervous. Maybe we do not manipulate the symbols correctly. And we were guided by the answers we wanted to get and we kind of doctored the rules such as to reproduce these answers. But these new lattice models make the treatment manifestly correct and allows us to give rigorous formulation of uh, these lattice models, of these continuum models. So having said that, I'm not going to review the lattice models here. This is a talk that we've given, we've given almost entirely within the continuum. But whenever the continuum treatment will be subtle or can be questionable, we can always go back to the lattice and make sure that what we're doing is correct. So this will be a continuum talk. When I gave similar talks to a more condensed matter audience, I focused on the lattice rather than on the continuum. So here we just take the continuum and if confused, we can always go back to the lattice. And since I have only a few minutes, 35 minutes I was told, I will focus only on one example, which is the simplest one, but it captures some of the subtleties, although not all of them. And this will be kind of almost straightforward analysis using quantum field theory 101, except that we will encounter various subtleties along the way that would be interesting. And the main result that we will see is that there will be very unusual UVIR mixing, various phenomena uh, short distance and the long distance are mixed together. Uh, just to tell you one of the punchlines, removing the UV cutoff, removing an IR cutoff, these two phenomena do not commute with each other. So as we'll see very clearly, this is something that I have not yet seen in a st standard field theory, that these two limits don't compute. So as I said before, our discussion can be formulated on the lattice, but instead we'll present it here in the continuum. So after this long introduction, let me present the model. So these gentlemen, Paramakanti, Balance, and Fisher, wrote some lattice model, and they took some kind of naive continuum limit. This is a model in two plus one dimensions. And this is the action that we can consider. So phi is a compact scalar field. Very, this will end up being very similar to the C equals one model, but will differ from it in some crucial things. First of all, it is in two plus one dimensions rather than one plus one dimensions. It has a standard looking time derivative term. There is no term with, with two derivatives in space, but there is a term with four derivatives in space. But all of that should not be an obstacle because if you took quantum field theory 101, this is a quadratic action. The equation of motion is linear in phi. We can just solve the equation of motion, put the mode expansion. We can compute all the correlation functions because everything is Gaussian. And we'll just follow our nose and see what we find. So the first peculiar thing that this model has is a subsystem global symmetry. What is a subsystem global symmetry? We have a network current, which satisfies the following conservation equation. So what we have on the right-hand side is not merely d by dx of something plus d by dy of something, but we have something that can be written as d by dx, d by dy of jx1. And as a result, we have many conserved charges because Imagine we take this car in J tau and integrate it over Y. If we integrate it over Y and we hit it with the time derivative, the time derivative here, we can use the conservation equation and then integrate by parts to find that it's conserved. So we have a conserved charge for every value of X and for every value of Y. These are different conserved charges at different values of X and Y. This is the subsystem symmetry that I mentioned earlier. Let me make it more concrete in this case, and it will be very similar to the C equals one compact boson. And I'm using the same terminology as in the C equals one compact boson. We have a momentum symmetry where the time component of, this, of the current is phi dot. Here I'm using Euclidean signature. And the space component of the current is dx dy phi. And the net conservation equation is nothing but the equation of motion of phi, and therefore this is a conserved current. If we have a conserved current, we can, we can construct these charges. And when we can construct the charges, we can ask what do they do to the fields? 
And what they do is they take the field and shift it by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. And I emphasize that these functions of these two functions, alpha of x and alpha of y, are completely arbitrary. They could even be discontinuous. And you can check by substituting it in the action. You see this term is clearly invariant. And even if alpha of x is a discontinuous function, this term is still invariant. It is invariant because the d by dy kills it. The experience with the C equals one system tells us that we should also be looking for a winding symmetry. And indeed, there is a winding symmetry. This is also a conserved current when we swap, when we swap these two currents. And it is conserved because derivatives commute. So this system has momentum and winding symmetry, very much like C equals one system, except that these are subsystem symmetry. And the fact that winding and, and momentum are so similar suggests that there is some kind of self-duality. And in that, indeed, if we just treat this system the way we normally do, we can show that this model is invariant. There's a self-duality that exchanges mu and mu zero. Notice it kind of inverts the couplings and it ex exchanges the momentum and winding symmetries. So now we take the textbook and say, what do we do with the C equals one system? Let's analyze the spectrum of this model. So, for simplicity, I'll put it on the square torus with Lx and Ly both equal to L. So otherwise, the equations are longer, but it can easily be done. And the first thing we do is just write a Fourier decomposition of the field. So we have plane waves, or all these oscillatory modes with integers kx and ky, where both of them are non-zero. And in addition, we have all the modes with kx equals, with ky equals zero, and all the modes with kx equals zero. And we have to be careful not to count the zero mode twice. So this is a decomposition. So far, I haven't done anything. And when we substitute this thing into the action, we find that these modes, this function of t, this function of t, and this function of t are independent degrees of freedom. This is what we normally do in free field theory. If you wish, we go to normal. This is the normal mode expansion. So this, these are oscillators of plane waves. And they have a dispersion relation that comes from just substituting this in the action. So it's omega squared depends on these integers k, x, and k, y. But the dispersion relation here is non-standard because the action is non-standard. And because of this dispersion relation, the energies decay like, behave like one over the length squared. Normally energies scale like one over length. Here they scale like one over L squared. We'll soon have, so we'll see some consequences of that. Second, if L is large, and such that there are lots of low states, we can have low energy with arbitrarily large momentum. The momentum in the x direction is the integer kx divided by L, provided Py is small. In other words, we can have here low energy with high momentum in the x direction, provided the momentum in the y direction is small. This is something that we are not used to. We can have very low energy states with very, very high momentum. This is the source of the UVIR mixing that I will soon discuss. This is extremely unusual, and I'll discuss it in more detail soon. Let's go back to this decomposition. Where are the momentum and winding modes? I discussed the oscillators. What are the momentum and winding modes? These are like the momentum modes. So when we quantize that, which we'll do in the next slide, we'll see that the states coming from the quantization of these modes give us states charged under the momentum subsystem symmetry. We can think of them as being modes associated with the spontaneous breaking of this symmetry, but we'll soon see that in the quantum theory, the symmetry is restored. This part is exactly as in the C equals one system. So I simply ignore the modes of X, so you'll get the zero mode here, or similarly here, that's what we do in the C equals one system. Here it is in two plus one dimensions, so there are more labels. Nadi, a quick question. Yeah. Yes. Why are the first two terms functions of t? Are, are I can't hear you. Why are the, the first two terms are functions of t or they're- in They're functions of t, that's what we normally do. We write the decomposition, all the non-zero momentum modes are here. If you wish, these modes have non-zero momentum in the x direction, but vanishing momentum in the y direction. Oh, oh they're, they're linear functions of t. Not linear. They're not linear. It's an arbitrary function. So it's arbitrary momentum in the x direction. Yes. 
this is decomposition. So so far, I haven't done anything. Oh, you didn't solve the equation of motion yet. Sorry. I have not imposed any equation of motion already. Yeah, okay. I just took the decomposition and I plug it in. Usually, we separate the non-zero momentum modes and the zero momentum modes. We separate here and here separately. Here, in, I didn't. That's what we normally do, but I didn't do it here. I add parenthetically that ordinary winding modes, which are linear in X or linear in Y, are already included here, so I, shall, I don't have to include them separately. So here we see a surprise, which is unlike what we have in this C equals one compact boson. Let's ignore the fact that the zero modes of these two modes are coupled together. Then phi X and phi Y are independent rotors. We just substitute it back in the action. We get the following effect. So we take this expansion we had before, we substitute it in the action, the terms with phi dot, given these two terms, but there is no spatial derivative. So this is the same as a C equals one comp compact boson. Each of them is like a C equals one compact boson, but without the spatial derivative. If we don't have the spatial derivative, then this rotor can, can, can uh, rotate very rapidly, differently, at different values of x. So this could be subtle, and the cleanest way to analyze it is to put it back on the lattice. So we discretize space in x here and discretize y here. We use integer values. Then we have independent rotors. Every phi is compact. So the, it's the eigenvalue of its momentum are integers. And we write the Hamiltonian. And this is the spectrum. And the key thing here is that the lattice spacing appear, appears in the denominator. You wish in the Lagrangian, when we discretize it, the lattice spacing appears in the numerator. So in the Hamiltonian, it appears in the denominator. So we see that all these energies coming from that, from these momentum modes, from these functions, phi of x and phi of y, their energy diverges is one over a. So they have both one over l and one over a. What about the winding modes? What about states that are charged and the winding symmetry? So this slide will be kind of busy, but the main point is that we can try and find functions phi such that they will be charged under the winding charges that I presented. This is the configuration. But when we substitute it back in the action to find the action of the winding modes, we find that the action is infinite. So as we restore the lattice spacing, it scales like one over L times A. So let me summarize this discussion because it might've been confusing. We really just follow our node. We don't do anything which is unusual here. This is a free field theory. There's no excuse not to get it right because we just diagonalize the small fluctuation operator and solve it. And we find plane waves created by these operators with energy, remind you, decay like one over L squared. We also find states charged under the momentum symmetry and state charged under the winding symmetry but they have energy which diverges. First of all, instead of one over L squared, they have one over L. And what's more interesting is that they have one over the lattice space here, and therefore their energy diverges in the continuum. We can also check here that the duality that exchanges the momentum and winding modes as we predicted. So this is a check. But the main thing we learned from all that is that even though our system has momentum and winding symmetry, and it has momentum and winding currents. And if we regularize it, it has states charged under the momentum and winding symmetries. In the continuum limit, only the plane wave survives. All the states that are charged under the symmetry are not in the continuum limit. They are pushed up to infinity because of this one over A. This is quite peculiar that we have a system with a global symmetry, there's a conserved charge, but all the charged states have infinite energy. It's somewhat reminiscent of the skirmion, where the skirmion is the skirmion is made out of pions. The baryon current exists in the pion theory, but the mass of the baryon of the skirmion is infinitely heavy compared to the mass of the pion. So you can have the conserved current, but the charge states is infinitely heavy. So this is the main surprising result from this calculation of the spectrum that all these states are infinitely heavy in the continuum limit. They do exist in the Hilbert space of the lattice system. So if you regularize everything, they, there's a nice Hilbert space, there are charged states, 
and the states are there with finite energy. And there are dynamical excitations of the lattice system, but they are not dynamical excitations in the continuum theory. They are kind of pushed out of the Hilbert space of the continuum theory. So one could ask, should we or should we not discuss these states at all? Andy, you have a question? Yeah, Andy. Uh, so why wouldn't you just, is there a different theory that doesn't have these states that has the same continuum limit? Uh, that's a fantastic question. And let me rephrase your question. Your question is, should we even discuss these states at all? Because they're not there in the continuum. Should we or should we not discuss these states? We have the conservative, we have the current, and this, the states are there on the lattice. Should we or should we not, if we are continuum people, should we or should we not discuss these states? Are they in any way meaningful? And the answer is yes, they are meaningful. And the reason is that they conserve charge. And if they conserve charge, they are not excitations in the Hilbert space, but they can be viewed as defects in the spectrum. So there is the Hilbert space, and then there is another Hilbert space when we add this guy, it has infinite energy compared to the previous Hilbert space, but we can still study small fluctuations around that state. So I hope this answers your question, Andy. Yeah. So we should really, so everything is now meaningful. We have plane waves in no states like that in the Hilbert space. There is a defect that we can put in, and then there is a Hilbert space around the defect, but the field theory captures all of it. Let me phrase it a little bit differently because this will give us another perspective of what we saw here. But the defect and is not dynamical, right? It's not dynamical, that's correct. That's exactly right. It's not dynamical, but we can scatter. If we add more interactions, we could scatter off it and there would be a different description around that defect. Yeah. So it's like putting a, in QED, in Q gauge theory, in Q U1 gauge theory, we don't have charges. But we can put the charge there, an infinitely heavy charge. It's described by a Wilson line. And then we can discuss the QED or the U1 Maxwell theory in the presence of this heavy charge. Uh, so this is very similar. That's called the, the defect. Let's go back to the lattice and restore and summarize what we had. We wrote the formulas in terms of continuum variables. So the plane wave had one over L square, and the momentum and winding had one over L times A. A being the lattice space. If we write it in terms of the number of lattice sites in A, so wherever we see little l, we write the uh, A times big L, and we get these formulas. These formulas are quite unusual and surprising because we want to take the continuum limit, or we want to take the limit when L goes to infinity, the number of sites goes to infinity. So what did we do above? Above, we took A to zero, and this is my ultra, the, my color for ultraviolet. We took A to zero with fixed length. That kept the plane waves and all the charge states were pushed to infinity. This is what I was saying over the, in the last few minutes. We take the lattice spacing to zero, we hold the length of the system fixed. The plane waves survive and all these states were pushed to infinity. There's another limit we could take. All the lattice spacing fixed and send still the number of sites to infinity such that the total length it goes to infinity. If we do that, all these states go to zero energy, except not at the same rate. These states go to zero energy faster than these states. So this is very unusual. If we take, we take big L to infinity, the number of sites to infinity, with the lattice, together with the lattice spacing going to zero, what we see is that only these states survive. If, however, we take, the, and then we can take L to infinity. If, however, we take the limits in the other order, we first take the size to infinity with fixed A, and then send A to zero, and all these states go to zero energy. So I summarize it by this equation. This is one of the main results of this talk. Letting the size of the system go to infinity, this is the infrared limit. And taking the lattice spacing to zero, which is the ultraviolet limit, these two processes do not commute. The fact that two limits don't commute, that's not a big deal. We're very used to that. That's not new. But it is surprising in the field theory 
that removing the ultraviolet cutoff and removing the infrared cutoff, these two operations don't compute. It took me quite a while to really believe this statement because it's so unusual. In order to get better perspective into it, let's check some correlation functions. And again, the theory is completely solvable. So we just write formulas and we just need to analyze the formulas. And we said we've done it many different ways because we didn't trust the answers. And the cleanest way to do that is to do it on the lattice. So we go to this lattice model, we do it on the lattice, we fix a gauge, everything is computed, is determined by some Green's function on the lattice. So it's very explicit, but it's a very complicated expression, but it's very explicit. So we just write the Green's function. And now if we have the Green's function, this is, since this is a free field theory, we can just study correlation functions. So we considered correlation functions of various quote unquote good operators, like into the I phi or the time derivative of phi or the X dy phi, et cetera. And we took L to infinity, the total number of sites to infinity. So everything is done on the lattice so that everything is regularized. And then we can take various limits. So we take L to infinity. And as I said before, this can be done two different ways. A continuum field, a continuum field theorist or a high energy physicist will say, we take the lattice spacing to zero with fixed length, fixed lattice size, fixed space. The number of the, the size of space is say five centimeters. And we have operators at fixed position in space separated by many lattice points. That's what a quantum field theory, a continuum quantum field theory is. And then we, if we want, we can take the infinite volume so that we are in non-compact space. Another limit we could take is that what we can call the thermodynamic limit. We keep A fixed and we take the number of sites to infinity as we take the length to infinity. And later we can say, separate the operators to many lattice spacing apart. So it's again, these are the two limits that are recalled from the spectrum, they do not compute. So the first two point function we can consider is this two point function of phi dot. So we took the continuum limit and then the infinite volume limit. So L goes to infinity. And I simplified the expression by dropping the mu and mu zero and various two pi's and so forth. And there's a complicated expression for the two point function, but it simplifies in two limits, when the time separation is much bigger than x times y, or when the time separation is much, much bigger or much smaller than x times y. So at long distance, uh, if x and y are very large, it decays like a power, we are used to that. But when x times y is small and relative to tau, then we have a very strange behavior. The one over tau square, you could say, okay, this is standard power behavior. But there is an interesting logarithm here. And since x times y is much smaller than tau, this logarithm diverges. So if we look at the two point function, two operators at separate time, and x times y equals zero, so either x is zero or either x goes to zero or y goes to zero, there's nothing from the, they are not at the same point. If both x and y are zero, you could say, well, at least they are at the same point in space. These operators are not at the same point in space, and they're definitely not at the same time, yet there is a divergence. So the two-point function exhibits a divergence, which we, I'm going to interpret as a UV divergence, for reasons I will soon explain, when two operators are not on top of each other. This is very unusual. It's very rare in field theory, although there are some examples of that. So first of all, this divergence is absent on the, when the lattice spacing is non-zero. Hence, the interpretation is a UV a singularity. Second, we can also see where it comes from. Imagine we take x to zero with fixed y. If x goes to zero with fixed y, it is associated with large px. Now, I've already said that the dispersion relation allows us to have small omega with large px, provided py is sufficiently small. That means that I can have large singular, can have such singularities associated with large momentum in the x direction, provided PY is small and then omega can be small. Let me say it differently. This is the expression, this was just copied from the previous slide. Let's regularize the system in the infrared. If we regularize the system in the infrared, PY cannot get too small. If PY cannot be too small, then PY has to be bigger than one over L. 
And then the singularity at x equals zero becomes a log singularity by L, determined by L. And if both are small, it's another expression. So what we see here is again, this UBIR mixing singularity, mixing, because in the spectrum I've said, in the spectrum of plane wave, we have this UBIR mixing, large momentum occurs with low energy. Here we see it in the correlation function. The singularity here is x, y goes to zero can be interpreted as a UB singularity, but at the same time, it is regularized by putting the system in finite volume. So it's both a UV and an IR singularity. And that's a sign again of the UVIR mixing. The second correlation function I'd like to study is the two point function of same momentum operators. Let's see if it works the same as winding operator. So again, we can do it on the lattice, so we can do it in the continuum, and we should take the, li the various limits of these expressions. The subsystem global symmetry tells us that these two operators must be at the same position in space, although not at the same position in time. So these are two operators at the same position in space, separated in time. And the fact, the subsystem symmetry, these objects are charged under the subsystem symmetry. And in order to satisfy the subsystem symmetry selection rule, they have to be at the same point in space. So again, we take the continuum limit. So we do this on the lattice, so there's no question that both we're doing is correct. We take the continuum limit and we find this expression. It decays exponentially as tau over LA. A again is the lattice basic. That shouldn't be surprising because if we put a complete set of states here, this correlation function is dominated by the lowest state that carries the charge. And I've already told you that the state that carries the lowest state that carries the charge is energy of order one over LA. So the exponential suppression at large time reflects this intermediate state. The upshot of all that is if I take A to zero, these operators, these exponential operators, vanish in the continuum limit. This is the counterpart of the statement that these operating corresponding states are not part of the Hilbert space of the continuum theory. So if I act with this operator on the ground state, it tries to take me out of the Hilbert space, and therefore these operators are zero in the continuum limit. In the con language of the renormalization group, such operators are called redundant operators. These are operators whose correlation length is the lattice space. We could also take the other limit. In fact, the original paper of Paramakanti, Ballard Fisher, computed the, uh, this correlation function on the lattice. And now I recall this is the other limit. This is the limit where we take the number of sites, number of sites to infinity, not removing the lattice space. In this limit, this is the expression we get. In a standard conformal field theory, we get one log here. Here we get log square, and I hope I balanced all the parentheses correctly. The main point is what appears in the exponent is not log of tau over a square, but log square. So for large tau, it decays faster than any power because we can say that one log makes a power and the other one says it's a power of tau raised to another power of, of the logarithm. So this two point function decays faster than any power. It's not part of any conformal field theory, only scaling variant theory. Another manifestation of that is that the lattice spacing here, normally when we have just one power of the log, the, lo the, la the dependence on the lattice spacing here in the exponent is absorbed in wave function renormalization of the operator, such that in the end, we get a formula which does not depend on the lattice spacing. Here, because of this log square, we cannot do that. So the upshot of all that is that again, e to the i phi vanishes in the continuum limit, and this is a redundant operator. So a continuum field theorist should interpret this operator as being absent in the continuum theory. And again, this reflects the UVIR mixing in the spectrum of the momentum states. The energies of these states in this diverge in the previous limit. Here, they do, in this limit, they do not diverge, but they are still parametrically larger than all the plane waves. So I've focused so far on one particular example, but in the long series of papers I wrote with my fantastic collaborators over the pandemic, we studied lots and lots of models. This is kind of the one that we always go back to when we're confused. We, this model is gapless. We discussed this plane waves. 
there are various gap models with this subsystem symmetries, not U1, but Zn. We also studied gauge theories of this subsystem symmetry. If we have a peculiar global symmetry, we can ask what happens if we gauge it. We also, here I discussed two plus one dimensions. We can do it in three plus one dimensions. And then there are various other subsystem symmetries that are possible. One particular example of that is a three plus one dimension um, version of what I said here. And it's not U1, but Zn. And it's also a gauge theory. This is even more, a more interesting model. It's a gap model. And that tends to agree with what is known as the XQ model, which is one of the first models of fractals. So models of fractals fit in this framework. And I just presented here the simplest example of them. So all these models have a modified Villain version and a corresponding continuum description. All of them exhibit UVIR mixing of various kinds. I presented some, I exhibited some UVIR mixing in the talk today, but the other models exhibit even more bizarre and more strange uh, UVIR mixing. In particular, this model, the XQ model, is a very strange degeneracy, ground state degeneracy. It's a model in three plus one dimensions. N is the N of Zn, it labels the model. And the number of ground states is twice the number of exponents here of the number of lattice sites. Lattice sites. So the number of lattice sites is in the exponent and the degeneracy in the continuum limit is infinite. So I'm running out of time, let me summarize. The low energy of limit of lattice models is expected to be a continuum quantum field theory. All of us were brainwashed that this is the case. But various exotic models challenge that because they, they, exist, they are manifest counterexamples of this claim. They are not described by a, a standard continuum quantum field theory. We use the word, word exotic. They are characterized kinematically, they are characterized by a subsystem global symmetry. And dynamically, they have this UVIR mixing, which makes it so challenging for a standard quantum field theory. Some of the models, not all of them, have a very large ground state degeneracy, not something that we're familiar with in ordinary field theory, and it's even infinite in the continuum limit. And one thing that we had to grapple with is the fact that some fields, some gauge parameters, and some observables are discontinuous. This is something that normally does not happen in field theory. Here, they can exist, and they play a crucial role in the analysis. And they also have defects with restricted mobility. And there's a lot to say here. There are defects that are restricted to move on the line, and there are defects that are restricted to be at the point. So it's a very rich subject that I did not discuss here. And what we've been doing during the pandemic is to construct very peculiar continuum field theories that capture all these facts. They capture the subsystem global symmetry, the UVIR mixing, the large ground state degeneracy. They use these discontinuous fields. And we had some kind of calculus how to manipulate these discontinuous fields. And the good news is that we succeeded to reproduce all the lattice mod results that people have produced earlier on the lattice. We also had new lattice models, with new phenomena, and it's a very rich story that emerges. So thank you, and please stay healthy. Thank you very much, Nadi. Do we have any questions from the audience here or the remote audience? Thank you, Andy, for the chat. <laughs> um, one question here, one second. I, I could ask, um, you said that there are different ways in, in approaching or taking different types of limits. Um, you could, uh, for example, take the X and Y direction separately to infinity. Have you tried that? And Yes, yes, we tried that. We tried to take various limits to take the limit of, say, LX to infinity. And again, for every one of the limits that I mentioned here, it can be done separately in different orders in the X and Y direction. And we kind of landed on our feet whenever we did that. So for example, if we take the number of sites in the X direction to infinity with fixed number of sites in the Y direction, this model becomes a collection of standard one plus one dimensional field theories. A set of them because they're labeled by Y and the continuum in X and time. 
So this is like a stack of field theories, but they couple to each other. So that's one way of taking it. The interest is really when we take the, the large number of sites, both in the X and in the Y direction. Another thing you can do, uh, which is also very strange here, we did it in the paper with Tom Rodelius and Shu Heng Xiao, consider twisted boundary conditions. Here I had the boundary conditions in X and Y were on a rectangle, which coincides with the directions X and Y. You can make put it on a torus with non-trivial tau one. And then it turns out that the symmetry has a certain non-abelian symmetry. The ground state degeneracy depends on the twist parameter, and it has all sorts of other uh, strange uh, phenomena. So even though the model is simple, because of this UVIR mixing, there is more information in the infrared beyond what we are used to, and it, it should really be explored. Another question, oh, a uh, question on the, you should just unmute yourself and ask, please. Me? Yeah, Andy. Yeah. Oh, um, could you, I, I mean, you've said this in different ways, but could you like just uh, uh, say again, is there things about the, the low energy theory that the low energy theorists will find unnatural, who doesn't any, know anything about the UV. Good. What, what exactly are those? Okay, so the first thing is that the low energy person will see is that certain correlation functions, let me give you, put it back on the screen. So you could say, imagine I'm a low energy person. I never heard of the lattice. I don't want to hear about the lattice. Can I say that this model has anything funny in it? So this is one result a low energy observer would find. The low energy observer would compute this two point function and we show, we'll see that there is a singularity when two operators are not on, it, are not on, on top of each other. They are a different Euclidean time and there could even be a different Y, but then as X goes to zero, there is a singularity, even though there's no operator at that point. And furthermore, if you regularize the system, that's what I did here by putting it in a box, you put it in the box, the singularity goes away. And in fact, it's funnier than that. The singularity is X goes to zero is regularized by the size of the box in the Y direction. And that follows from, you know, it's a straightforward algebra because it's a pre-field theory. So a low energy observer would see very unusual singularities in correlation functions, something that we, I have not seen before. The second thing that the low energy observer would say, okay, I had periodic boundary conditions in X and Y. This model depends specifically on what I mean by X and Y. And X. the low energy observer could write down some operator using their degrees of freedom that would kill these singularities. Is that right? No, no. The, the low energy observer has a phi and it has only plane waves. This is a good operator in the low energy theory. And the low energy observer can measure or compute this thing. And the low energy observer can even work on R2. You don't even need to put in finite volume. So the low energy observer spaces R2 finds this two point function. With a singularity in a location in space where there shouldn't be any singularity. But right? if the two operators are different time, different Y, when the two X's are the same, suddenly the, the two point function diverges. That's something new. And what it does, it, why does it diverge? It diverges because the momentum in the X direction can be very large. So even though this is a low energy observer, the low energy observer is sensitive to low energies, but he or she is still sensitive to large PX. If PX, can, PX can be very, very large and low energy observers can still see this phenomenon. So that's one aspect of it. And that's without ever mentioning the lattice. In that sense, it's universal. The second thing is what I said about the twisted boundary condition. If the boundary condition- so, so, Sorry, could I say, could you think of that as our intuition is being violated in a sense because there's no Lorentz invariance here? Is that- That's, Lorentz invariance is clearly crucial for that. But it's still surprising that we can have very, very short distances having effect 
a very low energy. Of course, with Lorentz invariance, you can't get that. But it, the generic system without Lorentz invariance does not have that behavior. So yes, violating Lorentz invariance is crucial, but that's not the only thing that is crucial. The second thing is what I mentioned earlier about the twisted boundary conditions. The ground state of this system is unique, is a unique ground state. But if there's a non-trivial tau one on the torus and tau one is a rational number, say P over, K, P over L, then the system has L ground states. So the number of ground states of the system on the torus with non-trivial tau one varies dramatically as we vary tau one. It's not even a smooth function of tau one. In various rational values, it has different values. And in fact, the global symmetry is slightly different as we vary uh, the denominator. And it hops all over the place. This is again, something that we are not used to in a quantum field theory, right? We put the system on the torus with some tau one, we change tau one a little bit, and suddenly we have a trillion ground states. Then we change it a little bit more, there's a unique ground state. So that's again something that the low energy observer can see. And every one of these peculiarities, so I, as I, I'd like to emphasize again, I presented here the simplest model. Every one of these peculiarities becomes much worse, or much, I couldn't say worse, maybe better, becomes more dramatic in the other models. This model is Two plus one dimensions in three plus one dimensions it's much richer a, this model is a u1 symmetry if you have a discrete symmetry it's for gate symmetries all these peculiarities are more dramatic and again they are detected by a low energy observer i have one quick question actually if if you take a model i like can barely hear you you know i can hear andy very well but i cannot hear you if I take a system similar to start with the system you have, and then you deform it by some interactions. Yes. Flow back to something that has the same kind of properties or. Yeah. Or okay. Excellent question. So what you're really asking me is whether this system is robust. Right. Exactly. Okay. Let's review how we analyze this question in an ordinary field theory. We took some system at short distances and we tuned it perhaps, and we found some system at long distances. Now we explore it. And now we ask ourselves, imagine we change a little bit the system at short distances. What effect does this have at long distances? So the textbook tells you what to do. Every operator at short distances is mapped to some operator at long distances. And the question is whether the deformation at short distances is mapped to a relevant operator or an irrelevant operator at long distances. And what we have seen here is that the operators like d tau phi or dx dy phi, et cetera, are all good operators at low energies and all of them are either marginal or irrelevant. So they don't cause any problem. The more, then, more interesting ones are the operators that violate the subsystem symmetries because they are in danger of ruining the whole structure. But as I emphasized, these operators, not only are they irrelevant, they are actually infinitely irrelevant because all these exponentials, I mentioned it here, all these operators are infinitely irrelevant. They are redundant operators. So if you say, ah, and on the lattice, we had some momentum symmetry and winding symmetry. I don't like them. Let's deform the system a little bit. So I have nothing to say if the coefficient of the deformation is large. But if the coefficient of the deformation is small, I can analyze it in the low energy theory by perturbing by these exponentials. But as I emphasize, the, these exponentials don't do anything at low energies. Because what they do is that they create these heavy states. So in fact, this system is quite robust. And so an operator like del x of phi all squared is... So we, we can go through the entire list of operators. We've done that very carefully in the papers. You can also consider operators which are e to the i delta x phi, so that they violate only the winding, the, the momentum symmetry in one direction, but not in another. And every one of them can do it with the momentum and winding. And all these operators turned out to be 
uh, infinitely relevant. Now, it might be that make, turning them on with infinitesimal coefficients is still stable, but turning them on, but the range where it's stable, the range could be very small. That I do not know how to analyze. All I know is that infinitesimal deformations of the system do not ruin it. What happens with large coefficients is not something that a low energy observer can detect, can answer, because it is not universal. It depends on all sorts of short distance details. In fact, what I mean by a small coefficient or a large coefficient is it depends on how we formulated the model on the lattice. But in the continuum limit, the best we can say is that we explore infinitesimal deformations and then this system is robust. Yeah. Thanks. So let's uh, first thank Nadi again for a great talk. Thank you for having me. And I really wish I could be there at the lake and have this fantastic. You're going to dinner, right? The dinners were also fantastic there, I remember.